This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Our reading continues in Esther chapter 2, picking up at verse 12. Before a young woman's turn came to go in to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shyashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favour of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favour and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the book of the Annals in the presence of the king. Amen. So Esther chapter 2, all I can say is, thanks Frank. (laughs) What do you do with Esther chapter 2? I mean, not least because I think at a number of of places, a number of places, it either says something or doesn't say something that you just don't expect. You expect something different. Um, For example, uh, at the end of the second paragraph, oh, sorry, I've got paragraphs, you're not quite sure, you've got paragraphs. Verse 7, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This my translation is slightly different from one that was read. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. And that's it. Why not? And she was deeply godly. Well, she was gorgeous. And then the king's edict is proclaimed, and they say, let's, let's have this beauty contest and we'll, we'll choose um, uh, a new wife for the king, or a new queen for, for the king. Esther, this is verse 8, halfway through. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. But because of her faithfulness to Yahweh, she said, I will not take part in this. Nope. She pleased him and won his favor. Okay, and then down down to verse 10. Esther proudly stood up 
for one of, as being one of God's people in a pagan land. No. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai told her not to. And then, <clears throat> uh, over, <laughs> for me it's over the page. And when the turn came for Esther, the young woman whom Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing and refused to go in to see this old despot. No. She didn't. In fact, whatever went on between Xerxes and Esther that night, Xerxes wasn't half happy with it. Interesting to preach on Esther as a model for young women to follow. Doesn't immediately jump out of the page at me, I have to say. So, what do we do with this? Well, we've had a, a couple of hints already. Something sa uh, Sarah said earlier on, something Frank said the, this morning um, when Mark emailed me at uh, the tail end of last week or the beginning of, of this week, I've forgotten something he said, and that's the subtext of the book of Esther is God is working underneath the surface. Of course that's true. Definitely true. So do we simply take four weeks and say exactly the same thing every week? But, so we know that's going on underneath the surface of chapter 2. But what do we actually do with the material of chapter 2? How do we bring anything from this that makes any sort of sense to us as Christian people? Well, on the screen, uh, you can see where I'm going. We'll be thinking about contemporary culture. And I'm going to suggest to you that as we interact with temporary culture, as contemporary culture gives us decisions to make, it may be a job offer, it may be a friendship group that's inviting us to join them, it may be all sorts of things that contemporary culture says, oh, come and join us. We can look on those as opportunities to walk with Christ in this pagan place, or we can look on them as temptations and say, no, we will not do that. That's what we're going to be thinking our way through. And I tell you now straight up, I don't have final answers. But what I do hope to, to give you, both from this chapter and from other parts of both Old and New Testament, is if you like a set of tools that we can take when we're in these situations, when we're in situations where contemporary culture says, come on, do this. And we have to decide as Christians, do we go for it or not? Okay? I think we need to pray together. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have created us in your own image. And part of being in your image is that you have given us minds to think with. You have made us intelligent creatures. But as fallen creatures, we recognize that our thinking patterns are not always all that they should be. So we pray that this evening you would help us to understand your purposes for us and how we are to think through some very difficult questions. Enable us by your Spirit to hear your voice and to respond spirit to spirit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the question is, how do we discern between the two? How do we discern between something that is an opportunity for us to grasp or something that is a temptation for us to avoid, especially when that, com uh, when that uh, choice comes to us in Spanish and uh, we don't really understand what's going on? And actually, there's truth in that. We may not fully understand what's going on. In fact, we probably won't fully understand what's going on when, we're, uh, when we have these hard choices to make. So, there are a couple of choices in the chapter here. Let's deal with them in reverse order. First is Mordecai's easy choice. 
And Mordecai's easy choice comes up in verses 19 to 23, that last section that we read. It seems to me fairly straightforward that if you're an upright person and you hear two people plotting against the king, that the righteous thing to do is to say there's something bad going on here. It's obviously bad. There's no question about it, and I have to do something about it. And that was exactly where Mordecai was. Murder, rebellion, he's there. And if we want New Testament support for that, we look in places, for example, like Romans 13, where we are to respect governments and the rule of law. And so we stand against obvious sin. And sometimes standing against obvious sin gets us into trouble. Here, it was great for Mordecai. All worked out really well for him. Not always. Let me come back to that later. So, that was the easy choice for Mordecai. And if you look through the rest of the Scriptures, you'll find lots of those easy choices. Can I just give you another one, because it's going to come up later? When Nathan the prophet um, heard about David and Bathsheba, he could have run with the culture and said, well, you know, that's what kings do. Or he could have stood for Christ. That was wrong, wasn't it? He could have stood for God. <laughs> I keep forgetting we're in the Old Testament. He could have stood for what God says and stood up against the king. Bless him. He did. I think that's a fabulous chapter. I, I can never quote it apart from in the uh, authorized version, Thou art the man. Wonderful. Okay, so an easy choice, Mordecai, Nathan. Then let's come to Esther's choice, because Esther's choice was much, much more difficult. In fact, I think what I've hinted at in the introduction to the sermon really is probably where most of us would have expected this book to go, because other books in the Old Testament go in this way, where a godly person has a choice to make, and they stand for righteousness. Of course, let me deal with just another little, little potential problem here or potential way out. We wonder how much choice did Esther actually have? Did they send people round the various provinces looking at the wells and in the markets and talking to people and saying, who are the gorgeous girls about here? You know, this could be a great opportunity to send your daughter, your niece, your sister to the palace. Or did they go around all the local schools and say, bring out your sixth form to us, get them to line up. We're taking you, 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 and you. The rest of you, bye. How much choice did she have? We don't know. So let's go on the assumption that she did have choice. If she didn't have a choice, well then, we would have to take a very, very different direction. So how did she go about making her choice? Well, she could have said, uh, as I already, already hinted, no, this is a godless thing, I will stand against it. Or she could have said, this is an opportunity to influence Xerxes, the king. And, and maybe she thought, oh, just go with me on this one, don't ask too many questions about this. She could have thought, I, you know, I remember hearing stories about Daniel. And Daniel was in, in the, the, the king's palace, and, and he did what was, what was right is this my opportunity to go into Xerxes and, and do what's right? Could be. Or th there's that, that young fella, um, Nehemiah. I think he's starting to rise up through the civil service. And he's doing good things. I, could that be for me as well? You can see an awkward choice for her to make. So the question is, how did she go about making that choice? What can we gather from the chapter, and what can we gather from gleaning other parts of Scripture? I'm not going to be giving you a whole host of references tonight. You'll not remember them, but if you want references for what I'm saying, give me a shout, and, and I'll get them to you. First thing that we know from the uh, chapter itself is that she had the long-term support of Mordecai. 
at the end of, of verse 7, uh, Mordecai had taken her as, her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. Now, I think we're supposed to infer from that 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 had been for quite a long time, that perhaps an infant, say she had been an infant or maybe just a young child, but certainly for a time he had taken her. So let's think for a minute about long-term support for folk who have difficult decisions to make. What does it mean, A, if we're like Mordecai in a family, and by implication or by inference from that, what does it mean for us as a Christian community? As we support those who are making difficult decisions, if my wife was here, she would say, Drew, you're probably the worst person in the world to talk about this because you've never made a difficult decision in your life. Um, being a minister, you're not in touch with the real world as those who work in industry or in, uh, in uh, hospitality. They're really in touch with it. What do you know about it? And I have sympathy with that. That's why I'm not trying to give you all the answers. I can't. But hopefully with these tools, you'll be able to, to just wrestle through these things yourself. So the first thing was that Esther had, had the support of a loving family and a, a, and a wise family. Mordecai gave her wise advice that stood her in good stead. As an adopted daughter, she really benefited from that. Need I say any more to those who are parents or those who will become parents? How crucial is it for us to be good parents? And good in the Christian biblical definition of it. Providing, I mean, as, as Frank said in the baptism this morning, nurture, admonition, or in, in the older phrase uh, that, that used to be very common, by prayer, precept, and example, guiding our, our children towards adulthood. And of course, as we think of it, we, we recognize that it's a long term commitment the commitment of parents to children. And I would suggest the commitment that we have to each other in this church is not a short-term commitment. It doesn't just go four or five years. It's for as long as we are here, we are committed to each other. And we see that in, in Mordecai as well. He doesn't just wave goodbye to Esther as she goes into the harem. He actually makes a point of hanging about, of being close to her. I'm wandering here a bit because this isn't necessarily directly in, in chapter 2, although it does pop up later. Being committed to each other, to, be, to, to a long-term support, particularly of those who are younger than us, involves sacrifice. I mean, do I really need to say anything more about that to parents? Do I? I don't think so. You know that as well as I do. And yet, I think part of the awful truth of contemporary culture that we have to stand against is that having children is to make me complete. Having children is my right. Having children is just about my life. It's not. It just isn't. The call to be a parent is a call to sacrifice. Let's never forget that. The call to be a leader in the church over our young people, or with our young people in particular, is a call to sacrifice. And again, just in passing, we recognize that this type of, of support actually becomes mutual. I'm thinking here of Jesus' words on the cross, where Jesus looked down at two people, at his mother who had supported him and loved him, and at John, the young fellow, he seems to have been um, quite a bit younger than the others, who had, whom Jesus had nurtured. And he recognized that now these two were to come together and that there was to be a movement of care from the older to the younger. And I would suggest again to you that contemporary society is doing nothing to help us with this, is doing nothing to sow in the minds of young people, that there will come a point in your life probably where the movement of care is equaled out and then you take over as your parents become less capable. And so we keep close to each other. As Mordecai kept close to Esther, we keep close 
and we walk with each other through the difficulties of life and through the good things of life. And so we live in community together. It means that we go into those difficult situations together. We learn from each other as part of our ongoing lives, and we're close enough to support each other. Can I throw another wee word in here? We're close enough to support each other quickly rather than having to wait and wait and wait. Okay, let's come directly then to, to this question of, of going with culture or not. Now, I'm, I'm sorry that that's, that's a bit small, as with most of the pictures I put up. It says the bandwagon effect, when our desire for harmony or conformity sways our decision-making. And you can see the two, two paths, one with all the people going one way, on the other that looks like a lonely path. How do we know when to go to the right and how do we know when it's time to go to the left? Let's think about that for, for a while. But Esther actually shows us that there are some people for whom this is a real problem. And it's that little description that I read out for, for you earlier that she was absolutely gorgeous, if I can paraphrase it, if Esther hadn't been absolutely gorgeous, she wouldn't have had the problem. She would have been left quietly to one side to get on with her life. <laughs> I googled when I was looking for an image for this. Guess what I googled? I googled the most beautiful woman in the world. And I thought, I'll just put up the first picture that comes up. I'm not going to spend any time. I'll put up the first picture. And here it is. I haven't a clue who that is. Anybody know who it is? No, I have absolutely no idea. But Mr. Google, bless him, thinks she's the most beautiful girl in the world. There are times in sermons when you think, and a funny comment here would be worthwhile, this is not one of them. <laughs> but it does illustrate, Esther's position here does illustrate for us that there's sometimes when our particular gifting or a particular quality brings us into more difficult situations. It may be physical beauty or handsomeness. It may be our academic ability that sets us above uh, other people. It may be our business acumen that sets us apart from the crowd. It may be our sporting ability or our artistic flair that mean that people look at us and say, ah, yeah, you're a bit special. Or maybe it's that we have a caring spirit that looks out for people, that makes friends easily that supports people who are in difficulty. That's what we have. So the things that make us that bit special in contemporary culture's eyes are the things that can bring us into these difficult places where we have awkward decisions to make. And then there are two legitimate Christian approaches. See, this is where it does really get awkward. And this is where it's much easier to preach on one of the other um, people that I mentioned earlier. We can say, yes, I will get involved as a legitimate Christian option, or we can say, no, I will not get involved as a legitimate Christian option. I will bear witness in this, tempt, in, in this situation in which I will be tempted to do significant wrong things, but I will bear witness for Jesus. Or we say, no, that is pure temptation. I will not get involved with that. I've already mentioned Esther took, took this path, the, the positive path, if you like. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we will not do this. Both commended. That doesn't help us very much, does it? Can I tie it down in a few examples? Or maybe give you the sort of situations I'm, I'm talking about. If I just throw out a few examples. Um, employers. If you're offered a job with an employer and you think, well, that employer, mm, mm. I, I read about the English water companies a while ago. And when they were, when they were made independent, they were allowed to borrow money um, to help the business along. So what a number of them, in fact, I think most of them did, 
was at the end of each year they borrowed money not to invest but to pay dividends to their investors and you think that is surely godless so i shouldn't work for a water company now northern iron water doesn't get involved in that i should say or telling a lie or paying cash in hand to the scaffolder or paying a bribe or knowing that this particular project which would be really good for us has lottery money in the background somewhere all questionable things or marrying outside the Christian faith all things that make us sit up and think hmm well can, can I just put my cards on the table again and say it is possible as a Christian to say yes I will do that it is also possible as a Christian to say no here's a picture you don't often see in church some of you recognize him from 1979 um, yeah for those of you who don't recognize him this is Jerry Adams who was never a member of the IRA <laughs> And it was Jerry Adams whom I first heard use a phrase that actually goes back to a US general, I believe, around the Second World War. And that's the phrase that's on the screen. Sometimes we have to choose the least worst option. Sometimes we have to choose between two options, neither of which really are great. Both of them have problems. Both of them are difficult. And so we have to choose the one with least difficulties. Again, can I give you two examples? You'll know very well that Scripture is hostile to divorce. You know that as well as I do. But I am completely at ease in my mind that there are some times when I would say to a woman, no, you don't go back to him. You just don't. Or, if you fancy another ethical question, that's uh, it's this is really a lecture room ethical question. Do you know the mad axe man dilemma? No. The mad axe man dilemma is when somebody says to you, you should never, ever, ever tell a lie. And you've got to wag your finger when you say that. Never tell a lie. Well, you're standing in a room. There's a door there and a door on either side. And a group of children run in through this door screaming and they run out through that door. And then the mad axe man comes in and says, where did they go? Where did they go? I'm going to kill them. What do you do? What do you do? Because also you know behind this door are 20 policemen who are ready and waiting. So what do you do? Do you tell the truth or do you tell a lie? I think it's pretty simple, isn't it? So ethical dilemmas, sometimes straightforward sometimes will require much, much more thought. And can I make a guess here that maybe some of you are thinking through ethical dilemmas now and you're not sure what to do? That's normal. That's normal for a Christian. And Christians will come up with different answers. But can I encourage you? If you and your friend... Uh, are thinking through something that your friend wants to, to get an answer to, they give their answer, you disagree, what do you do? Do you walk away? No, of course you don't. You stay and you support. You differ, you disagree, but you say, my brother, my sister, I'm with you. And I'll walk through this together with you. And as you do that, you're also saying, I'm ready. My brother, my sister, I'm ready. I'm ready for when life falls apart. Or I'm ready for when you find the temptation just too great. Or I'm ready for when you find that standing alone is more than you can bear. I'm still walking with you when it gets just too, too difficult for you. And then here's our New Testament link. I'm ready to start again with you. And I say New Testament link because we're not just saying, okay, 
got it wrong, I'm going to step to one side, I'm going to start again. Our New Testament link here is that Jesus died and Jesus rose again. I just don't want to thump the pulpit when I say that. Jesus died and Jesus rose again. And that is our hope for when life goes belly up, for when things go completely wrong. Jesus died, but Jesus rose again. There is no more completely wrong than to die. And yet, Jesus lives. And he can come into any situation and say, let's go. Any more New Testament guidance then for us? Uh, let me just rattle through this quickly. Um, what was it folk used to wear on a little wristband, and somebody maybe still has a wristband with it? Anybody? Four letters? WWJD. And I reckon that's actually a pretty good place to start. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do if he were in this situation? Well, we have plenty of material in the Gospels where Jesus was in difficult situations, and he chose. He made his choice. So we can get a sense of what Jesus do. Yes, Jesus never went for a job with a water company. Jesus never uh, was invited to play for this team, but this team really doesn't do great things on a Saturday night after the match. But we know how Jesus responded in his context. And if we are people who follow Jesus, then we can get a sense of what he might be saying to us. And here's another one. What would Paul do? Well, again, Paul wrote a stack of letters. And so we can gather from his letters how he might have responded or how he advised the Thessalonians or the Corinthians or Timothy when they were facing their difficulties. What would Jesus do? What would Paul do? And then I have to say, this is my favorite. And you probably won't see this one coming either. I like that. She was closer to Esther than we might imagine, I suppose, wasn't she? Not that she was a godly woman who was taken into a difficult place. She was in a dreadful place, but became a godly woman. Try that one for size and see how it might work. The redeemed Mary Magdalene. New Testament also, of course, tells us to take wise advice. Again, many, many places I could come to. What do I mean by wise advice? Who do you take advice from? Oh, it's too late to wait for answers. You take advice usually from folk who are older, although not always. Usually from folk who have been in similar or in the same situation, though not always. Quite often from your peers who are in the same situation as you. Also think about taking advice from people who you know are actually quite likely to disagree with you. And they don't have to all be Christians to give good advice. Just saying. Take good advice. Take wise advice. Don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not taking your advice. Right through to, I'm sorry I got that wrong. Because that's the first step to putting things right. And then I'm finishing where exactly you would expect me to finish. Stay open to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Stay open to listening to what He has to say to us. Stay open, guarding your devotional life, taking that time. Re remember, when I say take wise advice, who do you go to? You go to people that you know, people you already have a relationship with by and large. And doesn't that make sense when we think of our relationship with Jesus? If our relationship with Jesus only consists of, Lord, I need your advice on this, or I need your guidance on that, what sort of relationship is that? So we keep our relationship with Jesus open. Doing what we were doing early in the service, saying, Jesus, aren't you wonderful? And thank you, Pamela, for your, for your prayer for that. That was just super. Take time to do that every day, to talk over things with Jesus. 
guard your worship, grow in maturity in general through all the normal ways of, of doing that. Keep talking with Jesus. Can I leave you with one verse? that uh, I think we've, we've just drifted into. But if you are, you will be in a situation where contemporary culture says, come on. And we're thinking, I'm not sure. Paul in Romans says this, when we can't even put it into words, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.